Good afternoon, and welcome to HealthSystemCIO.com's all-star panel, Communications and Care Coordination, What's Missing? A complimentary webinar from HealthSystemCIO.com sponsored by Datamotion. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I will be your moderator today. We're going to encourage you to ask questions. It's a good topic for it. You can type them in whenever they occur to you in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll leave the default set to all panelists and go ahead and send them in. We'll be posing them later in the program. You can download the deck by using the URL on your screen, and we've also got a shortened URL at the bottom of all slides. And we are recording today's event. We'll get that posted to our YouTube channel just as soon as possible. Uh, and you'll receive an email when it's ready, so you can go ahead and check it out. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we look to go about 45 minutes in total. First, we're going to have our panel discussion featuring Dr. Bill Braithwaite, founder of Braithwaite Consulting, Dr. Peter Tippett, CEO of Health Accelerate and chairman of Data Motion Health, and Dennis Robbins, Chief Clinical and Business Intelligence Officer with KPN. Um, I will be showing uh, slides as our speakers are talking that, that has some of their biographical information up there so you can get more information about them. But uh, we're going to jump right into our conversation with our speakers with a sort of a table setting question and get to know about uh, a little bit about each individual's organization and where they're coming from. So Dr. Tippett, would you start us off? Sure. Yeah, this sure. is uh, Peter Tippett. And, uh, uh, I, I've been a doctor, uh, you know, since since I could be, I guess. And uh, but I was in, into uh, computer uh, sciences uh, even before the PC came along, and uh, uh, early on got the bug on trying to mix the, the two things together. Uh, uh, about 12 years ago, I got involved with what was called the PTAC, the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee which is where the first health czar got uh, uh, named uh, Bill or Dave uh, Brailer. Uh, and I met uh, Bill Braithwaite there. Bill Braithwaite is the guy, you'll see, hear him in a second, who uh, uh, people call him the father of HIPAA. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Bill and I sort of hit it off uh, because uh, the problem that HIPAA was trying to solve really boiled down to the same problem that we've been trying to solve for the last 20 years which is how to get computers to actually do something useful in the furtherance of, of health care or care coordination or anything, anything uh, in, the, in the AAA. Uh, so I've been passionate about that. I've joined Verizon as its chief medical officer uh, uh, about eight years ago. I had a computer security company before that, and I did the first antivirus product before that. But really just a tech guy who's interested in how to make uh, – a computer security and healthcare work and drive this stuff forward. Excellent, excellent. Um, Dennis, you want to jump in? Sure, sure. Um, I I don't come out of the IT world primarily, but have gravitated towards it. My training has been uh, in uh, ethics and health policy. And early in the game, I realized that the only way in which we were going to make really significant changes in terms of our system or our non-system, our health care system, was to have information available that will give people something that can be actionable. And I believe that the solution was going to be through health information technology, so infuse myself into that domain. And what I'm bringing to the table today is I believe that if we're going to engage people and get them involved and change their lives and uh, have them uh, be interested in getting and becoming healthier, we need to change the complexion of how we do things. We need to focus away from a sickness model and a patient model to the person because patients are subservient, they're passive, they're wounded, um, and people, if it matters to them, it's important enough to them, uh, if, if it's something that make, will, will be something that will change their lives and they see the value in doing that, then indeed they'll make that change. So I'm interested in infusing the lessons from we can learn from information technology and a smarter way of approaching it along with getting the person engaged. And the person can be the physician, the person that we call the patient. I don't like to use the word patient, but really make a difference in that domain. Excellent. Dr. Braithwaite? Yeah, this is Bill Braithwaite. Uh, after 
teaching at the University of Colorado School of Medicine for a couple of decades, teaching new physicians how to practice medicine better with computers by their sides and getting feedback from them that things weren't happening fast enough. I took a sabbatical and came to Washington in 1994 and ended up in a health policy fellowship that enabled me to write a law called Administrative Simplification. And when that law got attached to and passed as part of HIPAA in 1996, I got hired by the Secretary of HHS to lead the writing of the regulations to implement it. So that's where the Dr. HIPAA uh, moniker comes from. And uh, after doing that for seven years, I went into private consulting, and uh, I'm still doing that. So here we are. So if you have rotten Trying tomatoes to... handy, you can throw them at Bill now about uh, inventing HIPAA. <laughs> Yeah, it used to be. I, I used to get a lot of arrows in the back about that, but now it's mostly they're handing me fruit uh, in my hand instead of throwing it at me because they're realizing uh, how important the HIPAA rules have turned out to be for the progress of healthcare in this uh, cybernetic world. Yeah, Dr. Braithwaite, I mean, um, HIPAA is intended to help people share information, and sometimes it's been used uh, to sort of inhibit that. So what are your thoughts around that? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, it's partly people were um, afraid of it. Um, it you, could, you can't imagine how many times people were telling me that they were being told by their lawyers and their administrations that they couldn't share data with the patients because HIPAA said they couldn't when in fact it says exactly the opposite. And people were afraid they were going to be thrown in jail for talking to their patients about things, uh, just crazy misinterpretations of the law. So anyway, we are gradually getting to the point where um, it is being more well understood, the, uh, the penalties for uh, violating the HIPAA rules are being more broadly broadcast so that people understand what's required and what isn't required. So it's getting better, but we still have this problem that the view for patient-centered care and care continuity across the <laughs> various venues in which we all receive health care over our lives is um, failing to come together properly as envisioned by the original HIPAA rules. Now, this is Peter Tippett. When, when uh... Uh, when HIPAA came out, I like to look at it as the P in HIPAA is for portability, which is interoperability, which is data exchange. And, you know, the problem that was generally trying to be solved was getting people to share information in a digital way and make it positive for, uh, you know, for, uh, for, you know, for moving the ball forward. Uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a child of this whole as most of us are, of this whole revolution, the Internet revolution or the PC revolution or the mobile revolution, and nobody had to twist anybody's arm to make them use word processors or email. Right? Everybody mm -hmm. just found that natural and useful and positive and, and productive. And, you know, we look back at the productivity of our economy, and uh, a lot of it, a lot of the improved productivity can be measured uh, and attributed to to the, the IT revolution that happened. But, uh, you know, when HIPAA came out, I, I would like to, you know, think that HIPAA was largely a response to the worries that doctors and other people in the health world had about privacy and security. They nat a lot of people naturally didn't use email to talk with each other about their patients. And part of that was because people were worried about privacy and security. And so the, the idea was if, if you could make the a wrapper on it that could help people understand the few simple things to do to get that part taken care of and then get on with sharing information, that would work. But Bill and I came together uh, 13 years ago uh, under a charge of the White House, that, but basically the charge said, uh, you know, if, if uh, I'm summarizing several years of testimony and work and whatnot, but basically the PTAC, the President's Information Technology Advisory Committee, which led to the uh, ARRA and high tech and meaningful use and all those things. Basically, it said, you know, if, if only healthcare would communicate at, uh, about as well digitally as the finance industry does, uh, we might save something like 
we thought originally it was $70 billion. Now the number from Institute of Medicine is more like $700 billion a year, huge uh, uh, numbers, um, which save huge amounts of money. Everybody would be healthier and live longer, and uh, we didn't have an entirely new kind of science. But other than that, it probably wouldn't be worth doing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> But so this is now 13 years ago when uh, HIPAA didn't seem to be accelerating health communication, <laughs> and uh, the PTAC was uh, produced what ultimately led to the meaningful use and bribing people with uh, 30 some odd billion dollars to use to make meaningful use of EMRs and whatnot. Here we are now, um, you know, five, six, seven years after that, depending on how you count. And if you read the blogs, if you read the world, everybody's um, uh, complaining that it's, that it's not working, that uh, we're, we still aren't communicating, that doctors' lives are miserable, that everybody's a slave to the computer, that patients aren't in the loop, that other care uh, team members aren't in the loop, that doctors don't send things to each other, certainly not out of the hospital or out of the same system. Uh, and this is why uh, the three of us have gotten together on Data Motion's advisory board, the sponsor of this uh, uh, webinar today. Data Motion uh, is, has a secure messaging platform that, uh, that we think might be a basis to help move data uh, and actually get people to send stuff to each other. Uh, and if somebody could figure out how to uh, get the adoption up, which is part of what our goal is, so that we can get clinicians to actually send stuff to each other um, and, and understand that the HIPAA and privacy and security and identity and other issues are taken care of and understand that the issues of integration into the EMR and, and uh, 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 you know, the rest of that sort of circle, integration into workflow are taken care of. Um, then maybe we can get on with, uh, you know, actually sending a message to the other doctor or sending a message to the, to the nurse practitioner or the patient even or the patient's sister or the daughter or somebody to help nudge or, or move uh, care forward. Um, uh, because if we, if we can get people actually communicating, uh, then it feels like, uh, you know, this, this charge that came out of PTAC would turn out to be true instead of being yet another sort of argument on, on why it is that people don't use these technologies. Yeah, Peter, Dennis Robbins, I'd like to jump in to follow a bit. Um, I think one of the things we need to do, we talk about clinicians and we talk about patients, and and for someone who's healthy, they, they might see their doctor less than 30 minutes a year. And there's a lot more in the year than 30 minutes in which most of us live our lives. And if we're really talking about getting people to become healthier and to bend the sickness curve, which ultimately we need to do if we're going to bend the cost curve, we need to think beyond the clinical forum. But we want to make information safe and secure so any of us will be willing to share that information, particularly information about genomics, STDs, behavioral health, that could otherwise come back and haunt us. And we do have the ability now to do secure messaging and to do it in a way that's not overwhelming for the individual person. And there's all kinds of ways in which we can engage the person to be involved and to have confidence in the system. It's not just about clinicians and sick people. It's about all of us. It's to make a healthier and a better world. Uh, that means doing some, that means we need to start embracing unstructured data. It means we need to think about moving not to just fetch approaches, but push approaches. I know you'll want to respond to that, but I think this can require a rethinking that can be so much more robust and so much better for our nation and the people that live within it. Dennis, I, this is Bill. I, I agree with you. But, you know, the, the things that we're talking about right now, they, they give people the assurance, give patients the assurance that they can securely communicate with their doctors and vice versa. Doctors can securely communicate patient information with, with anybody they need to. But there's a cultural problem as well. Um, you know, it, the, this tool and other tools have been out there for a while, but I think the, uh, the IOM report from 2012 called the best care at lower cost really pointed out the issues. They used examples in the negative to show what the cultural issues are. For example, they said if we applied the current 
culture of healthcare to banking, we would be standing in front of an ATM machine for days waiting for our money because the records had been unavailable or lost. Or we'd go to the grocery store and the product prices wouldn't be posted and the price would vary depending on, even within the same store, depending on the source of payment you used or which cashier you went to. And the pilots would be free to design their own pre-flight safety checks or not have one at all in the airline industry. This kind of cultural application to technology is kind of nuts. And so we have to find a way to apply this technology within a culture that makes people feel safe, comfortable, and communicative about their health information. Yeah, this I is certainly Peter, and I completely, completely <clears throat> agree with that. Um, and the question is, how do you know? How do we get the whole community to make a move? Or, or, or similarly, how do we get the CIOs of health systems to 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 make it so their doctors aren't, uh, you know, in complete revolt? To make it so that they actually get, uh, you know, positive ROI out of these very, very expensive systems? To make it so that they actually engage patients and, and uh, especially as we move to the capitated model, uh, how do we get it so that, that you know, the, the costs actually go down? They don't just theoretically go down, uh, you know, and, and uh, one of the mistakes I think we've made in the academic slash science slash uh, regulatory community has been that we've, we've decided that the only kind of data that's worth uh, creating or sharing is highly structured data. Um, and that uh, the only method that would make any sense at getting at that data is to put all data about every patient in one central place, make it available so that if a clinician or anybody needed access to it or the scientist, they could just get the access with the right, the proper rights and permissions. I would submit that we've never done that for anything else in the world. We've, we've, you know, when we have central repositories of data that people get at. Uh, you know, think of an airline reservation system. That's relatively few data fields. Uh, you know, a, a, a hundred or two hundred airlines, a bunch of flight numbers for each one with times, and demographic information about the people flying, and you know, some money to pay for it all. There's probably 50 fields worth of unique data in all of that, um, and they're all well understood. They're all well structured. They've been structured forever, <laughs> uh, and we understand that. In healthcare, most of the things that we want to talk about with each other are are nuanced things. It's not just that the person's diabetic, hypertensive, and and uh, uh, you know, and is on these meds. It's why this med is is this one and not some other one. It's the nuance of the the uh, the the why or the subtlety of what's what's wrong with this mix right now. What's wrong isn't that the diabetes is true or that the hypertension is true or that the numbers aren't quite right. It's usually something else that's not obvious. You know, the pill color doesn't go with this person's psyche uh, or something, the taste is wrong or there's all kinds of things that aren't, that couldn't possibly be put on a pick list that wind up being the subtlety of why something works for a particular patient and doesn't work for another one. Um, those sorts of things convey well in unstructured communication, like a conversation or like a note between a clinician and another one. Uh, and those things are particularly difficult to keep track of in structured uh, databases. So because, I, because we've focused so heavily on structure, 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 and we're still hearing more and more and more of it, uh, uh, it feels like it's time to, to enable uh, or re-enable um, unstructured uh, data. Uh, you know, if, if a patient doesn't know their vaccination record or they don't have a complete sample of it, but they need to know, they go rummaging around in the kitchen cabinet and pull out some yellow card from 10 years ago, uh, wouldn't that card written in pencil with, and pen with five different inks uh, over 20 years still be more useful than no data at all? And to the clinician, the answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> So wouldn't a photograph of that card sent to the clinician or the nurse or the whatever be more useful than nothing at all? And the answer is yes. I, I would submit that semi-structured data, dictations, uh, transcripts, um, you know, photographs, drawings, things like that, sent from one, out, one organization to another or one person to another is still the most useful kind of information 
to the human uh, and by em- by embracing it uh, and uh, you know and allowing people to uh, use more of it uh, yes it's not as easy to integrate into you know a a, a machine that's going to tabulate things or into science but it's much more appropriate for for humans to share and I think we just need to get Peter. back this... to doing to doing both <laughs> yeah Peter this is uh, this is bill again I, I think it's a great um, transition idea, uh, particularly for patients, for people, communicating in text is uh, a very positive thing if they can be assured of the confidentiality of that information, that it's transmitted to a specific individual and can't be seen by anybody else. I think that's a very good way to get into it. It doesn't deal with the longer term issue of trying to make the healthcare system in general in this country, a learning system where we have the structured data necessary to figure out what the population issues are, or where the Zika virus is popping up uh, automatically. But it certainly gets to the point of making people feel comfortable about communicating their health information. And in fact, um, you know, that may be the key to getting past this cultural uh, situation that we're in right now. If the patients would push for this communication, even in this unstructured form, and and we provide the the low cost mechanism for them to demand that this kind of communication go on, then there will be a a push to make this thing work. But clearly, passing a law or getting an IOM report or getting Congress to pay doctors some money. Um, isn't enough. We have to educate the patients so that they demand this kind of communication capability. Yeah, I, I was involved with a transcription company, uh, uh, you know, 10 and 15 years ago, and uh, uh, was all uh, excited about the fact that the data was already digital. By you know, over over the last 20 years, people have been using PCs instead of typewriters to translate the dictations into something. Therefore, the dictations were digital documents. Um, and uh, uh, I, I read a study, I can't remember exactly, it was probably five years ago, or maybe it was somewhere in there, in which uh, the Veterans Administration uh, took the data from transcriptions, from admission summaries, discharge summaries, uh, procedure summaries, and things like that, um, and uh, uh, ran it through some uh, uh, natural language work and created uh, alerts and, uh, uh, and warnings and things like that from it, uh, and did the same work against the structured data in the EMR. And it turned out that the data derived from the unstructured but digital dictation and transcription data gave better results than data <laughs> from the highly structured system. Uh, similarly, I've seen studies that show that the dictations uh, have fewer errors. It's very common for clinicians to cut and paste or copy or to to not be able to find the pick list uh, 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 for the exact thing they're thinking about, uh, and therefore just pick something that's close enough or something the last hypertensive diabetic uh, person with Crohn's disease and, and start from there, but they don't quite fix everything. And so. It turns out that uh, a lot of the clinical systems that are based on highly structured data, stored data have more errors in them, more <clears throat> substantial errors than ones that came from uh, from a clinician thinking through a problem and, and summarizing it for another clinician. Um, so those data start out structure uh, start out as data. They're not photos of paper. <laughs> So, the, but and they have more nuance in a denser form and more uh, uh, appropriate information and more subtlety for the next clinician. But we tend to not uh, not even embrace that kind of data. We tend to think, well, if we can get rid of dictation, we can save the money for the for that world and apply it to uh, to our EMRs and other structured, more highly structured arena. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to build. And, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not suggesting we give up on the EMR or structured data, nor am I suggesting that we think that that photographs of handwritten notes are the way to go. I'm just suggesting that 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 by giving by by being so uh, by hating the 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 poorly structured and lousily structured data so much, 
we've given up on a transition mechanism that can help us get to where we need to be. And if people start sending whatever they've got to each other, that data will make it into more and more structured formats as it gets used, uh, and, and we'll get to the right place anyway. We just need to solve the security and privacy and ubiquity problem of that communication. Let's have uh, Dennis jump in real quick, and then we'll get yeah. to you, Bill. Yeah, so 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 the point, I guess, Peter, that's pretty in between or sandwiched in with what you're saying is that it's the transmission of the information, the availability of diverse kinds of information, getting people comfortable sharing information. But the other component you raised I think is really huge. We want to make information actionable. We want to make it useful. We want to make it timely. So by using other things in, like AI and natural language processing, as you mentioned, where we can have this more continuous, we can integrate more live analytics, we can uh, do something to nudge or cajole people or to give reminders to, to sustain what we're trying to achieve, it becomes hugely important. And that we need to augment that as well, to make this something that becomes a living process rather than something stuck in an EHR. Dr. Yeah, so this is Bill. I was going to add to that that the ubiquity of the solution is clearly one of the problems. And we look at the ubiquity of cell phones in our population now. It's estimated that 90% of the U.S. population has cell phones, and at least three quarters of those, and rapidly growing numbers of those, are smartphones. People carry the capability of doing email and Facebook and Twitter uh, on them, with them, at all times. So the ubiquity is there in terms of communication. What we need is the ubiquity of secure communications to another person so that you're not broadcasting it on Twitter when you're sending your information to your doctor. You need to have that conversation comfortable and confidential but using the same technology. Right. Yeah, and and the you know the the basic rules of HIPAA and I'm an oversimplifier, so correct me if I've gone too far. <laughs> but the basic security rules of HIPAA boil down to know who the sender is and who the receiver is. That's the identity problem. Uh encrypt the traffic in route. Um, make sure the people uh, agree on how to take care of the data. Uh, that they're going to do a good job of it. That's the BAA or the contractual agreement, uh, and and uh, uh, and and uh, you know, uh, those are the big and, and log everything. <laughs> those are the giant, the big pieces of of uh, HIPAA, and uh, one of the reasons we've got, uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons we've all joined the Data Motion, uh, or at least I joined the Data Motion board is because all those components are natively part of the of the system. And uh, so is integration to uh, uh, essentially all the EMRs so that somebody can get something. If any of these documents show up uh, in, in an EMR input slate, they'll wind up just flowing straight in. They might be in a place where you have to view it with a PDF viewer instead of a native, but they'll at least get into the in, in there. And likewise, in the other direction. Um, but, but, you know, Every clinician in everyday practice uh, runs into these problems where the patient came from out of town or they're a snowbird or something, and they want to get the data to that other clinician that's five states away. And there's no easy way to make that happen. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, making things hard for people is, is a guaranteed way to make it never happen and to get people frustrated. Uh, so, so to the extent that uh, something as simple as sending a message to someone uh, that that can be directly imported, it could be cut and pasted, it could be directly automatically imported, it could become part of a workflow, it could be any of those things, um, uh, and we know for sure who the sender is and we know who, for sure who the receiver is, uh, and that those uh, those those the strength of uh, the security and privacy is well maintained. You know, that sort of a system is, you know, the, the four or five years ago, Meaningful Use 2 came out with a uh, sort of a requirement to enable direct, the uh, direct protocol, NHIN Direct is the more big, the NHIN Connect is sort of the name of the, of the,
static uh, data, highly structured data sharing. NHIN Direct is the name of the sort of lighter weight data sharing. Most of the NHIN Direct uh, protocols are based on email, which limits file size, but otherwise is pretty ubiquitous um, as long as you get the identity working. Uh, but uh, you know there are ways to to make it so that even file size limitations go away, uh, and integration of the EMR goes away, uh, and and those kinds of things are are coming and are are here. So it seems like this is a the, these piece parts are enough to to get the flywheel moving of people, particularly clinicians and their care their care teams actually sending stuff to each other and getting people comfortable with sending stuff to each other like we have for the last you know 100 years clinicians have long sent us mail or uh, telephone calls to each other to introduce them to the other patient uh, now we hit a button and, and an 80 page uh, output from an emr that everybody hates is available <laughs> to the other one and, and and most people who receive an 80 page quote <laughs> summary from an emr find the little handwritten note that sort of really nailed everything, and they, they really enjoy that. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm ranting a little bit in circles here. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter, I, um, Peter, 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 Peter let, me, let, me, let, me, let me add to that, too. I think one of the things we have to understand is the realities of the clinical forum and, and how, and how we, we operate. And, and, and one of the things is we don't have in today's world time to read and prepare an 80-page document before someone is seen if they come into our office or in urgent care or wherever they may be. It's just a reality. It doesn't happen. So that information may be there, but it's not being used and it's not actionable. So something that gets us what we need when we need it is what we need. Did I say that well? I guess so. Well, That's what I that was say. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is Bill, Peter. I had to... Uh, but in when you uh, simplified or oversimplified the HIPAA security rule. <laughs> I, I think you do have the, the essence right. If you know who's sending it, you know who's receiving it, and that it's encrypted in between, you have met the basic requirements for a security risk analysis that HIPAA requires. Um, but it's just a small part of HIPAA. In fact, the most the general part of HIPAA that really doesn't do much more than the standard security rules that we all operate under, figure out what's what the risk is and do something to prevent the risk from happening. And you've you've kind of nailed that. But you must admit that that's not far enough when it comes to exchanging health information that you can solve that aspect of the security rule and still get people afraid because of the interpretation of the privacy rule to actually communicate. Yeah, there's been the, the White House recently. Uh, I don't know if they published this narrowly or widely, but I've seen some uh, some output from um, uh, the uh, ONC about uh, uh, if you know some upcoming ideas that if uh, you know there's currently a it's been on the books for a while now that that uh, care settings, uh, hospitals, doctors' offices, and whatnot labs must uh, be willing to share digital versions of the of the results of the of the record with patients the the new tweak to that is uh, is that if if these organizations receive meaningful use money they must be willing to share that uh, using the very techniques that meaningful use required like uh, like and in direct <laughs> uh, and uh, you know to the extent that that uh, becomes more and more available, uh, and patients, uh, you know, I, 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 I personally, and I think most of us have these stories, uh, you know, I personally helped uh, one of my family members get some blood tests and then went back to the place and asked for the results, and they wouldn't give it to me. Of course, I'm a doctor, <laughs> and they wouldn't give it to me or my family member. <laughs> <laughs> and despite the fact that we got to their boss and their boss's boss, they still wouldn't do it. And uh, so I, I asked the White House if they could make some kind of a card with the White House emblem on it and put it on a piece of paper and make it <laughs> embossed or something that people could carry around and hand to folks and say, for gosh sakes, just give me what is owed me. Uh, so uh, part part of that is, is indeed a uh, an education thing. 
but uh, but uh, to the extent that we start getting people, I, I do think the majority of this transformation will happen as the as the mobile computing set and the the younger set tends to start demanding it. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. Demand is the key. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's well, important um, enough for them to do something, right? To them. Right. 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 It's, it's all, all about the, the person. Care of a, <laughs> yeah, all, all of us take care of a parent or an aunt or a cousin or somebody who's uh, you know, had a stroke or is getting older or has got some problem, and all of us get really really frustrated at being able to try and figure out how their you know, what results they got. Uh, you know, I had a, a, a family member who had a pulmonary, uh, a sleep study, in, uh, and uh, she, they, they moved in with us, and, and we were in a different state, and the next doctor wanted to get another sleep study. And we said, well, let's just get the results from the first one. It's, it's only yeah. four months old, right? And we went to that hospital VMR, and they had lots of stuff there, but they didn't have the results from the sleep study, even though it had done four months earlier. And, and endless calls later, you know, the answer was, well, we don't usually post our sleep studies to the EMR. And it's like, well, why not? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, can you send me the results? Well, I can fax them to somebody. And then we went another two weeks and tried to get the fax to happen with real doctors communicating with other doctors asking to please send the fax results of a sleep study. This is nuts, you know, if, if the patient – or the the son or daughter or whatever of the patient is driving the case and trying to make things happen and save money, time, travel, all the rest. Um, they are in a natural position to help drive this and and uh, using protocols like uh, Direct and platforms like Data Motion. There should be no reason that that patient couldn't say, "For just give me this stuff on my mother, uh, or or give my mother her stuff on this account." Uh, and I'll forward it on to the next doctor. <laughs> if you can't get it done, I'll get it done. Um, Peter, you're, Peter, you're Peter, absolutely Peter, right. De De Dennis, this again, is, would you be is, willing uh, to share um, some of what Data Motion has been able to do in traversing so many different EHRs? Because I think people would be very interested to hear that. Uh, because in my experience, nobody else has been able to do that. And that, that's kind of interesting in the interoperability and interconnectivity space. Well, yeah, that the data motion platform is uh, is the native uh, uh, hook for this direct protocol in 61 EMRs. It's integrated with another couple of dozen EMRs. So essentially, all the EMRs that are used in the normal world are natively uh, uh, have a native uh, connection protocol to the uh, to this system. So there's no, you know, it's, it's hours worth of work to get this stuff working, not days or weeks or months of integration. Um, that's just because those protocols are required by meaningful use, and if the hospital or clinic office, you know, got the check, then they've at least got the basics already working. Uh, so little little steps can make the make this actually work. The 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 advantages the data motion platform did beyond that are having identity platform that can bring on new people essentially on the fly. You don't need to wait for a notary and a bunch of round trip things to get somebody to get and address it in the system. It can happen within a minute or two with a totally automated system. They've reduced the cost of all that uh, by more than tenfold, down from an average of $100 down to an average of 10 or so to get new clinicians and others on the system. Uh, and, they've, and they've got an unlimited file size, so there's no need to – you could send things like x-rays and other things. So, yeah, I, that it's, uh, it's getting there. It's getting close. Very good. Uh, let's hold on. Hold on one moment. I just want to uh, um, thank our sponsor real quick, and then we'll get back to our questions. You've got a slide here that sort of explains what Data Motion is up to, uh, and I'm just going to read uh, some quick information for you, and then we'll get back to our questions. Uh, Data Motion Health is a division of Data Motion Inc., which has more than 16 years of experience providing secure data delivery services to healthcare, government, financial, and insurance industries. The entity empowers care teams to communicate more efficiently across the care continuum and with the persons they serve. It provides messaging and connectivity solutions for the secure and compliant exchange of PHI for clinical use and as part of the business of delivering improved person-centric care at reduced costs. For more information, 
check out datamotionhealth.com. Uh, let me get one question from the audience in front of you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Braithwaite, uh, we could start with you on this question. Um, as this comes from uh, a, certainly a well-known uh, uh, attendee of our webinars who's a former CIO. As we talk about cheaper, faster, and better for healthcare, what is your perception of the amount of waste that exists in healthcare? It appears that as much as one-third of healthcare procedures are unnecessary. How do we get to addressing the waste? Well, I think the, the very topic that we've been talking about, which is interoperability, and the very issues that we've been pointing out about communicating the results of studies between one healthcare organization or one physician and another are at the root of that. Um, very few healthcare institutions um, that, uh, at least from the doctor's perspective, will reorder a test when another test has been done somewhere else from a reputable source and is available uh, immediately. Um, and we can't get them. Uh, Peter's just talked about the fact that it's very difficult to get those things through the system right now, even though we have implemented the technology for doing that. It just reminds me of the, of the fact that if I want to deposit a check today, I can use my smartphone, which communicates electronically, instantaneously, and securely with my bank. I just take a picture of the check, and it's done. I can't do that today with a yellow uh, vaccination card or with an x-ray or anything like that uh, with most environments. If I could, and I could get that data instantly and quickly, then I wouldn't be ordering additional tests uh, or additional redundant tests. Very good. Yeah, that, um, that, uh, uh, let me let me just by the way, one way there. one way to solve that uh, problem is that if if uh, we believe that the system that's that's required for all meaningful use compliance sites, this direct uh, is uh, uh, working, and it is. It's not pervasive yet, but it's working and that little tweaks like we've just been talking about are enough to get it over the sort of utilization hurdle, lowering the cost and making it uh, unlimited file size and all that ubiquity-related uh, thing. Uh, then it could be that uh, the people who do the paying could say if the test was done and you didn't send it through a common protocol, then I'm going to dock the, the, the person who should have sent it, <laughs> right, or something like that. Uh, there may be some financial incentives that uh, that should stop test duplication. But that one-third number in the questioner's name was known to the PTAC 15 years ago. Uh, and it hasn't changed very much. No, it hasn't. Yeah. There's another component of which we haven't spoken here, too, and that's the uh, misperception sometimes of legal liability. And if we can get people to understand what the spirit of this thing is and what it can do and what we can achieve by doing it right, we may be able to diminish some of that, uh, those hyperbolical sort of uh, uh, approaches to uh, what, what risk is and to understand risk in a really intelligent and meaningful way. Let me just uh, get one question out there and then you can each take a shot at it and we'll be about um, out of time. It seems like we've touched on, so we're talking about information communication among clinicians. We've touched on some issues um, that prevent that, uh, which may or may not be, you know, largely solved. So we've got security issues, right? We've got technical issues. We say there are tools out there like those from Datamotion that make this possible and secure. Shouldn't be an issue, but you still have people that have concerns. You've got a legal framework, which Dr. Braithwaite touched on, that should make people feel comfortable. So legally, technically, we should be where we want to be. But again, Dr. Braithwaite, you touched on the cultural issues. Um, and these could include issues of, uh, you know, being afraid of someone stealing your patient or reimbursement issues or who's paying me for my time if I go, go and, and I'm sharing this information and, and it takes time. So what I want is an overview from each one of you of what is the biggest inhibitor currently to information being shared the way you all want it to be. You're all passionate about this issue. What's the biggest inhibitor and what can be done? Um, Dennis, why don't you start? 
It's always good to ask a non-IT guy a question like this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anytime. Uh, so, so, so I think it's it's a, a number of things. There's not one solution. I think again, the last thing I said, um, there's there's often an, an exaggerated sense of what legal liability is, and we often take the approach that we get from. Uh, more of a paid paranoid sort of approach rather than what can we do and do it well and how can we stay within the constraints and the, the limits of what's there. So a better understanding of that area is one. I think moving to utilizing, as Peter had indicated earlier, the importance of more unstructured data and have people have things at their fingertips where it's seen as being helpful and not onerous and to better integrate the person into the process. All of these things I think would be extremely meaningful in terms of making a difference. Dr. Braithwaite? Yes, um, I think that education uh, is at the root of the solutions to, the, to these issues. I mean, we have talked about the cultural issues, but those can be overridden if there's a demand from the patients for this communication. And through the patients and the people that they hire, people that they pay to pay for their health care into the culture of the healthcare system, that can change. The other aspect of the education is to educate the system and all the CIOs as part of that, that the cost, the overall cost of ownership of doing it the right way is very low now and it's low enough that everybody should be doing it. That message doesn't seem to get across um, across the industry for some reason. But if we can educate the patients to demand it and educate the CIOs that they can do it and it's cost effective to do that in the current environment, I think we might get a change past the cultural barriers. Very good. Dr. Tippett? Yeah, I think that, uh, and thank you so much, I think that the, uh, the legal issues, the safety and security and privacy issues are essentially solved. I, I've got lots of things that could that I can imagine would make HIPAA better or cheaper or stronger, and the same for other legal and regulatory frameworks. There's all kinds of things that that would that could make it better. But I would argue that it's it's more than good enough today as it stands. Uh, so we don't need to reinvent or improve HIPAA or its deployment uh, in order to make this this stuff work. Uh, likewise, uh, we have the protocols deployed in EMRs and EHRs and in all the various systems. We have deployed uh, all, all of the connectivity. We've got plenty of computing power in both in PCs and in mobile devices and whatnot so that uh, so that these sort of data sharing systems can work. And there's plenty of integration capability in the EMR to make good enough work. What we need to do is not let good enough get in the way, perfection and beautiful, you know, perfect structured everything get in the way of, of good enough. Um, uh, let me just give one quick example. There's a, uh, you mentioned uh, the, the uh, not getting charged and that might be a, a uh, thing. One of the uh, data motion implementations uh, is uh, uh, the, the lar very large hospital system discovered that since the data motion platform has the patient ID number as part of uh, its uh, profile for each patient that the clinicians communicate with, that every time a clinician communicates with a patient using that system, the log of that can go back to, uh, to the uh, EPIC billing system, which can wind up charging uh, and getting revenue that was never capturable before. Uh, so all of a sudden there is new revenue possible, uh, although less per encounter than a visit, still new revenue. <laughs> Uh, and all of a sudden there was a new value to actually talking with patients over such a system. So I think the overall problem is, uh, is what a lot of the tech startup people call crossing the chasm, that, uh, that once we get a, uh, a big enough group of people communicating this way with both structured and unstructured data with some integration and in using the standards, uh, this flywheel will get flowing and people will realize the benefits on each other just like the benefits of email and word processing and mobile devices and everything else wound up getting uh, uh, you know, across the chasm and, and then adoption happened. 
Very good. Well, that is uh, about all we had time for today. I want to thank uh, our panel, Dr. Peter Tippett, Dr. Bill Braithwaite, and Dennis Robbins for an excellent conversation, bringing to light an important issue I know they're all passionate about, trying to get uh, things moving in this area, information being shared for the benefit of patients. I want to thank our sponsor, Datamotion, as well. As I mentioned, you'll receive an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, within two business days, if not sooner. For those of you who have the CHIME CHCIO certification, I'll let CHIME know you attended. Attending our webinars get you one, gets you one CEU. Uh, if you've asked us to let CHIME know, we will. Sponsorship opportunities, you can contact Nancy Wilcox. General questions and comments, you can reach out to me. You will, when you close out your WebEx window today, a survey will pop up asking you what you thought of our event today. Please take, it'll take less than a minute to answer it. And you go to our website to view our upcoming schedule of events. So once again, I want to thank our panel, our attendees, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.